crazy preacher we got this weekend. He's all right, ain't he? Give it up for Brother Paul as he comes to share with us a little bit here. Dude. Bro. The only difference, he's the more the Oh boy, yeah. Yeah. That's right. Appreciate it, man. All right, how y'all doing? Yeah. Woo! Yeah, y'all give it up one more time for Roger and that band. Goodness gracious, Evan, that was awesome. Woo! Man, I love that. Goodness gracious. All right, y'all have a good day today? Nice, nice, nice. All right, look, here you go. Turn, uh, turn to your neighbor and give him a good old southern hallelujah. Go ahead, turn to your neighbor. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, now turn to your other neighbor who is obviously your second choice and just say, howdy. Howdy, that's all right. You were somebody's first choice before you were a second choice. It's okay. All right. Well, all right, y'all ready? If, we, if you got your Bibles, let's go to Luke chapter 15, and I'll tell you a little story. Luke chapter 15. I just want you to know how loved you are. Luke chapter 15, verse 11. And... Uh, so while you're getting there, I'll tell you a little story. Y'all know now, let me clarify something. I'm born and raised in Mississippi, Raymond, Mississippi, okay? And uh, now, a couple years ago, my wife and our kids, we moved to Columbia, South Carolina, so that's where we live. But I still got property in the SIP, okay? All right? So anyway, somebody from Columbia over there? Woo! Come on now. There you go, girl. Boom. All right, here we go. Hashtag, all right. Anyway, so, hey, did anybody do those rocks today? I think I saw one in there somewhere. Somebody do the rocks with the little, all right. Anyway, so that was good. Hey, had a good time. All right. So, so anyway, so, uh, so uh, in my, on my property in Mississippi, it, the, way, the way it works when we lived out there was we were right here. My parents were in the middle. And then my brother and his, his wife and five kids were over here. So it kind of all went like this. Well, one day, uh, I had the idea that you know, my daddy used to have a tractor. It was a Kubota tractor. And uh, it wasn't a deer, but you know what I'm saying. So, but, but I decided to go to my daddy's house. And by the way, this was just a few years ago. So I decided to go to my daddy's house and borrow the tractor to go bush hogging. Y'all know what bush hogging is? Okay, if you don't, if you, <laughs> if you don't know what bush hogging is, um, you just get a tractor with a big old blade, like a cutting thing on the back of it, and you just mow down some stuff, right? I mean, you just run over stuff. So why do you bush hog? I have no idea. But anyway, you just do it, right? I mean, it's just fun. So anyway, so I went to my daddy's house, and I said, hey, Dad, you mind if I borrow your tractor? And uh, he said, yeah, Pa, that's no big deal. He says, but I'm, I'm going to tell you one thing. Don't go on this side of your, <laughs> I'm sorry, don't go on this side of your property right here when you bush hog because we don't know what's over there. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, okay? I... Uh, in my mind, I'm sitting there going, I'm a grown man, right? It may be your tractor, but I'm a grown man. It's my property. I can do what I want to do. Did not say that out loud. That's what I was thinking. So anyway, so I, I get his tractor, and I make that one loop around the, you know, around the property. I'm just having a good old time, bush hogging and everything in the, in the way. I go that second loop. Man, it was awesome. It was such a good time, y'all. And then all of a sudden, I get to that point where I go down that third round where it would have been over here where my daddy specifically asked me and told me not to go. And I had this dilemma. You know what I'm talking about. You had that little angel on this side of your shoulder, and you had that little demon over here on your side of your shoulder, you know. And, and this was going, Paul, thou probably shouldest obey us, thou father. And then this one over here is going, <laughs> just do it. Come on. Yeah. So I did what anybody, any good son would do. I went with that guy. So anyway, so I take it. I take it around that third loop, boy, and I'm going. And y'all, I lie to you not. True story. I get right over there and do exactly what my dad told me not to do. I did my thing my way, right? And I went right over here, and that tractor went. And it started to sink. And I mean like to another country type of sink. You know what I'm saying? I mean, look. So I'm in there. There's briar, like stickers all around me. Thankful I didn't get cut. But I'm sitting there going. Oh, no. My daddy is, I don't know why I thought that. I said, my daddy is going to eat me alive. Uh, that's, that's cannibalism frowned upon in most societies, by the way. Just saying. But, but I sit there going like, oh, my goodness. So I did what he did. I said, you know, I thought to myself, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm a smart guy. Not really. But I said, I made a 49 on my ACT. We can probably figure this thing out. So, oh, you did too. I got you. I understand what you're talking about. I hear you. Okay. For those of you who don't know, some of you are like, oh, my goodness, he's smart. No, two plus two is five. That's three of my ACTs put together, 15, 17, 17. 
49. <laughs> For those of you that are laughing, you haven't taken it. You probably will make a 49 too. But anyway, so praise God. They're maybe not as important as they used to be. I don't know. So anyway, um, so, so anyway, so I think, I can do this. I got this. No big deal. My dad's not home. I got this. So for the next three and a half hours, I take some boards, right? I take some pipes. I start sticking them under the tire. I get boards, pipes, little small puppies, put them under the thing of the tires. And I start, I start doing this. I get four-wheel drive trucks and chains and all this kind of stuff. And I'm trying to pull, it, pull this thing out and get this thing out. And the harder that I try to fix my mess to uns- uh, get my tractor, my dad's tractor unstuck, guess what happens? I'm not sure what you just said, but I think you said the stucker it got. Exactly. That's exactly what happened. Okay. So, so after all three and a half hours, I am covered from head to toe in mud and slime. Y'all, let me tell you something. The, so the, the more I'm doing it, the deeper it's getting in whatever this is. Y'all, I promise you, this all around my tractor is like this, it's like this sludge. It, it looks like a, like a pool of evolution. I said, is that Charles Darwin down there? I said, look, <laughs> it's so funny. I said, oh. And anyway, so I'm doing all this, and then finally, I have done everything I know how to do. I have tried and tried and tried. I have got my dad's tractor Stuck. I have done what he has asked me not to do and said, I'll do it my way. And I got that baby stuck. So I go over here and I sit down on a hill that I got my tractor. I got my mess my in front of me. All my efforts to get it out did not help. It got made it worse. And then I got my dad, who I see over here in the corner, has just gotten home. Thankfully, he did not see me. And I sit down. And I remember like it was yesterday. Y'all might think it's kind of weird. I go all through like all these different type of things and emotions, you right? You see, I wasn't just dirty on the outside in that moment. I felt dirty on the inside. I don't know if any of you have ever felt dirty on the inside for something that maybe you've done or hadn't done, but I did. I started getting angry. I started getting angry at my dad. I said, Dad, why in the world would, to myself I'm saying this, I said, why in the world would you let me borrow your tractor knowing that I have ruined half the stuff you let me borrow? I said, when I, I, said, I ran your work car into the house when I was 18. You got what I'm saying? Like, it's not, it's not good. I said, that same tractor, I busted your water spigot and ruined all your water pipes. In my mind, I'm getting mad at him. Why would you let me borrow it? Then I went from angry at my dad to now angry at myself. And I don't know if you have a problem with this. I started beating myself up, you know, I'm real hard on myself kind of thing. I started feeling like this shame. Like, I felt very alone and lonely and all this kind of stuff and all the things that I've done is just sitting right there in front of me, just staring at me. And I knew at that moment I had a choice to make. Do I sit there, try harder, though I've tried everything I can do, I've only made it worse? Or do I humble myself and get up and go to my father's house? And I think Jesus gives us a story here in Luke chapter 15, verse 11. And whether you've heard this story a thousand times, or this is the first time you've heard it. Maybe tonight we could all together look at it and go, ask the question, where are are you? Where am I in this story? Who do I relate to? Now, here we go. we got two guys here. You ready? Let's look at Luke chapter 15, verse 11. Here's what it says. And Jesus said, there was a man who had, how many sons? Two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, hey, father, would you give me the share of the property that's coming to me, my inheritance? And the father said, yeah, he divided his property between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had, took a journey into a far country. I bet that was a hot country. That's probably Mississippi. But anyway, so it's like a a far country, ways away. And there he squandered, he blew it, right? He he squandered all of his property in reckless, reckless or wild and crazy living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine didn't have any food in the land. Kind of like, an epi- like a pandemic or something like that. Arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fee- uh, fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. Now, there's two sons. Now, ladies, you're not excluded here. This is for you as, as well as it is for the dudes in the room. So think about this. So there's a son that goes up to his dad. Imagine Levi, my oldest son. He's 10 now. <laughs> He wrestles bears for fun on the side, just saying. So anyway, imagine he comes up to me one day and he's a little nervous. He comes up and he goes, hey, hey, uh, hey Dad. I said, yeah, son, what's up, man? He goes, uh, I got a question. Um, is it possible, um, number one, um, have you been working out? No, not at all. Uh, been eating bacon and donuts, praise God, in Jesus' name, you know what I'm saying? Anyway, so I said, but no. He goes, uh, Dad, I just kind of want to know something. Um, would it be possible maybe today if you could, I don't know, uh, die 
that's what I said. What? Go ask your mama, son. I'm just joking. <laughs> I didn't say that. Sorry, honey. Anyway, so, see, but here's the funny thing. Oh, Levi, he thinks he's getting something from me when I die. I'm like, I want to say, boy, that's why I named you Levi. May the Lord be your inheritance. Repeat after me, Jesus, I trust you. <laughs> you ain't getting nothing, boy. Follow Jesus <laughs> and get everything. Anyway, so, but, but, but that's, that's, the, that's the, uh, the setting that we have here. This boy goes to his daddy and is like, I really want you dead. I really just, I really don't want you. I really just want your stuff. I really just want to go and have my own life. Because here's why. Now watch it. Here it is. There's this place that's called the far country. And in the far country, man, it represents so much stuff when we get into it in just a second. But here's the crazy thing. The far country was inside of this old boy before he ever stepped foot in the far country. It's like the far country and all that it represents was in his DNA. It was in his bloodstream. It's almost like he was born with it. And it's like that, that whole thing, maybe it was in the newspapers, maybe it was, it was in the social media realm of his day, whatever that is. But everything in it, it beckoned him and it called him and it drew him to where he could not even wait for his father's die. It goes, I got to have it now. And the far country, if you think about it, the far country really could be kind of defined like sin city. It's almost like kind of what's portrayed as like this, this lifestyle of what you've always wanted deep inside. That if you could get whatever you wanted to do with no rules or nothing, this would be the far country. The far country is like what shapes and molds our identity. The far country, you ready, could really be named this. You'd be the president. It'd be all about you. It could be all about yourself. It would be my life. My body, it could be my choices. I could watch whatever I wanted to watch whenever I wanted to watch it. I could put in front of my face whatever I wanted to. I could date who I wanted to, marry who I wanted to, without regard for God or for anybody or anything else. That's the far country. The far country says, it's all about you. It's all about me. And there's a draw to that. The far country says, hey, there's some sins of your choice, whatever you like. Hey, here's the far country. It's popularity. You can get those likes. You can get those hearts. You can get all those things all you want to. It makes it feel like it's about you when in reality it's really not. It promises you this popularity. The far country and all it represents, it, deep inside of us is it's all about our desire. Man, what, and, and your pleasure and my pleasure. What I feel makes it real. What I like makes it right. I have this desire in me. I just got to get out. I can't hold it anymore. And there's freedom. But in actuality, you're in bondage and we don't even know it in the far country. You see, the far country is sin city. The far country says this is who God is. But maybe deep inside, maybe I could simply live and take that title for myself. Now, you wouldn't say that out loud in the far country. But, our act, but the actions and the thoughts and the things that we do and don't do in the far country show that that's a reality in our hearts. That's the far country. And this old boy did that for a long time. I mean, he had a blast. He's just living it up, you know what I'm saying? He's just doing whatever he wants to do. It's good. I mean, it's all about him. It's so awesome. This is the life I've always wanted. Because you see, there's a way that seems right to us, isn't it? It seems right to do that. I mean, why would you deny yourself what you feel? Why would you deny yourself what you want? Why would you deny yourself what you like? Why would you put all these rules and lists of things that God did when, you know what, maybe that's not right. Maybe you could kind of create your own little mini world. That's the far country. And you ready? It's inside of every single one of us from birth. It's called a sin nature. And it takes us to all these places, and it forms and shapes our identity of who we are takes our focus. Well, this old boy's living it up. He's made some really bad choices. He's made the things that he wanted. He took what his father had given him. In our case, here's how it applies. We've taken what God has given us, and we've done with it whatever we want. We've taken the body he's given us, the brain he's given us, the life he's given us, the stuff that he's given us that's meant to be a kindness to lead us to him, and we've said, it's mine, I'll do with it what I want. That's the far country. That's Sin City. And that's where this old boy was. And he was having a blast because it promises, sin promises so much, doesn't it, y'all? Doesn't it promise so much? It's like, this is awesome. I can, this is so good. And for a while, it's, it is kind of fun. But you ready? There's a way that seems right to us. But in the end, it leads to death. And that's proven to be true worldwide. 
that promises so much, but in the end, it actually takes our life. And I need you to understand something. There's many reasons why God hates sin in our lives. There's many reasons when we take his tractor and do whatever we want to with it. There's many reasons, right? But one of the reasons why God hates sin and whatever that looks like in your personal life, in my life, whatever that looks like, here's one of the reasons. You ready? Because it kills us. Because it actually does harm for, uh, to us even if in the moment we don't see it. Not only does it take it far away from him, but it is hurting us. It's sapping life from us. It's, it's drawing life uh, away from us instead of giving us life. And God hates that. He doesn't like that because he is the author of your life and mine. And he came to give you life and, and bring new life to each and every one of us. But it's the far country that's inside of us. It's the far country that, we, that our feet take us and places that we go and the choices that we make. To, to listen to ourselves or culture or someone else rather than God, that's the far country mentality. And this old boy's been living it up, y'all, till finally the money ran out. And his, all his friends pushed him away. The popularity that he had, gone. Everything that he tried to build his life around now crumbled in the end. And he's left to his own choices. He's left alone and empty. He's left just simply existing. No more purpose. And the life that he thought he wanted, now gone. Now, I've always wondered, what if the story ended right here? <laughs> you ever thought about that? Like, what if Jesus ended the story right here? And this old boy, like, I can imagine the Pharisees, like all the religious leaders who are listening to Jesus, who he's talking to, I can imagine every single one of them are going, ooh, yeah, I like this story. Yeah, that's right. This old boy did his own decisions. Man, God ain't got one to know to do with him. He's rejected God. There's a famine in the land. That's God's judgment. I mean, this guy's left him. Now he's, now he's wanting some, some slop from the pigs, which is totally, totally like the lowest point in Jewish culture. Like He's at the lowest point because of his own decisions. And if Jesus ended the story right here at this point, the Pharisees are going, yes. You know, I wasn't whole sure about Jesus. I mean, I liked him when he was 12. I didn't know him about him right now. I like Jesus. This guy's giving this guy exactly what he deserves. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. But what if the story ended right here? What if your story ended right here? And God gave you exactly what you deserve. And the tractor of your life stayed stuck. Not just for this life, but forever. But here's the great thing. Jesus does not end the story right here. So this old boy's story doesn't end here, and our story doesn't have to end here, in our choices, in our sin, in our decisions. It doesn't have, our, our, our life, so to speak, because of our choices, doesn't have to stay stuck and away from our Father. Here's the main character. Here's the, now enters the main character. And if you, you don't, maybe you don't relate to anybody else, but think about this main character is a loving Father who represents God. Here's the loving Father. So all of a sudden, this old boy, his own choices, his own sin, it's just left him right here, just stuck. He just stuck in a rut, and he can't get out. He tried to get out, but he can't get out. All of a sudden, I don't know how it looked, but I think it might be something like this. Maybe you think maybe something different. That'd be kind of cool to see one day. I think all of a sudden, it's like, all of a sudden, this guy's like, wait a minute. I got a father at home that loves me. I remember, I remember the stories. They tell me, I, I, so he gets up. He humbles himself. Let me tell you something. God is opposed to the proud. When you, we keep pushing God away and pushing God away. Or this is still pride when we go, there's just no way I could go to God with my sin. There's just no way he can be who he says he is. There's just no way that I can believe that God, the God of the Bible, the God that I, that I hear about, that's really what he's like when, I, when I've done what I've done. But he gets up. He humbles himself. And he changes the course at that moment. That's called repentance. He changes the course and he takes a step and goes to his father's house. And he's got that speech going, you know what I'm saying? He's like, hey, hey, I'm going to do this. Father, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned, uh, could, could you forgive me? Could you maybe make me like one of your hired servants? And, and, you know, and all these things. And he's just rehearsing his speech. He's just rehearsing your speech. Let me tell you, some of you are, might be rehearsing your speech because of the sins in your life. And God's not saying, would you, he's just saying this, would you stop rehearsing and just come home? 
That's what he's saying to us, right? So this son, he gets there, and here's what happens. The main character enters the stage, and I love it. It's so good. It's like this guy represents God, this father. It's like from a long way off at the back of the auditorium. It's like the father sees him in a long way off. And you understand, remember this. You get what I'm saying. This boy ain't just dirty on the outside. He dirty on the inside. He doesn't just smell like sin. He's like, he's like the embodiment of sin. And he's walking. He smells like a, how do you say, he smells like a, uh, he smells like a porta potty on a southern summer day. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about too. I don't know why I'm rubbing my stomach right now. But anyway, so, I mean, it's like, <laughs> I'm getting sick thinking about it. <laughs> I'm getting sick thinking about it. Sorry about that. My bad. But here's the thing. It's something we don't like to hear. It's something we don't like to hear. But we realize that, that sin really does smell that bad in the nostrils of a holy God. Like, we don't like to hear that. We're like, I better, better not think about that. No, my God's love. Oh, yeah, God is love. But he is a holy God. And it is, is, it is loving for him to be who he is. It's loving for him to hate our sin for a lot of reasons. It's loving for him not to want us to stay in our sin but to come home to him. It's loving for him to let us know that sin is not good. It's not good for us. It hasn't done anything for us but in the end destroy us. So this old boy, he's coming, and his father sees him at a distance. Now, we don't care about this, but in Jewish culture, it says the father, the father picked up his, his drawers, like his robe, and it showed his thighs, right? It showed his thighs. Now, in our culture, we, it don't make no difference. We're like, who's wearing short shorts? You know what I'm saying? It doesn't matter. Like, it's the same, same thing. Sorry, I won't do that again. My bad. Uh, so, but it doesn't matter to us, but to the Jewish culture, this is like the father who has all this status, like all this reputation. It's like in one moment he's going, I don't care about my reputation. I care about my son. You see. And he pulls, his, his, uh, he pulls it up and he takes off at a dead sprint. I mean. <laughs> and all of a sudden he, he, he surprises this boy who is just nasty embodiment of sin. He picks him up. And he gives him a hug, and the, the son's like, Dad, I'm sorry about this. I, I sinned against you. And the daddy only let him finish. He don't care about that speech. I mean, it's good that he recognizes. That's awesome. But he comes home, and the daddy picks him up, and he, and he smiles. The, the son might have thought, my daddy's going to smother me and kill me. But instead, his daddy smothered him with kisses. He might have thought a whole lot of things, but his daddy hugs him tight. His daddy puts his own robe over him. His daddy puts his own ring on him. His daddy puts some new shoes on him. Now watch this now. Watch what happens. Oh my goodness, it's so good. Watch what happens. Jewish law, Old Testament, first part of the Bible, Jewish law, God's law in the Old Testament for God's people says this. This type of behavior deserves you to gather the whole community around, your neighbors, your friends, your relatives, gather them all around the person that's drugged your name, God's name, through the mud, and pick up stones and start doing some baseball pitches. <laughs> and stone him to death. But what's different about this father is he does gather the town around him. He does gather all the people around him. But it's not to stone him to death, it's to celebrate his return. That's crazy. You see what I'm saying? Like, so this father hugs him, forgives him, clothes him, and throws a huge celebration for him. Because here I need you to understand something. The father picks up his, his drawers. He bears his thighs. He runs to hug him. He, accept, he just hugs him. and He forgives him because God does not care what he looks like loving you and me in our sin. He doesn't. Jesus hung naked on a cross for crying out loud. The father is the only one who has the right to get even with this boy. This boy has literally on purpose, he has taken his dad's tractor that his dad said don't do it, and he's drug it through the mud, and he's cared nothing about the name of his father or his father at all. He's only cared about himself. He's openly rebelled against God and against his dad. And the father is the only one who has the right to get even. God is the only one who has the right to get even with us in our sin because we have sinned. I have sinned against him. 
And watch what the daddy does. He does not get even with this boy. He forgives him. When Jesus says, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, that term forgiveness literally means I give up my right, my right to get even. Let me tell you what you don't see. You do not see the father go, well, I'll tell you what. I'll let you come back and you can work for me in a little place over here. But I promise you one thing. If you ever, if you ever make one more move out of my house, if you ever think about that far country, if I even think you're thinking about that far country, if you ever think about dishonoring me again by your choices and your sinful behavior, if you ever dishonor me like that again, I will, I'll make you wish you were in the far country and eating that pig slop. You understand me? You never see the father hold that boy's sin over his head. And the father's the only person that has the right to do that. You never see the father belittle the son. You never see it. And the father had every right to. You never see him bring it back up. You ready? Because if love covers a multitude of sins, the love of God in Christ Jesus covers every one of ours. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him, will not perish, but have everlasting life. Believe it. See. When God says, I have removed your sin, my sin and your sin, as far as east is to west, There's no, there's no wonder that Jesus says that, that this gospel, this good news must be proclaimed to all the world that of, of repentance and forgiveness of sins to every single person on planet earth, and then the end will come. So all of a sudden, the daddy gets this. He, so I want, to, I want you to see what was restored to this boy when he came to his father. He was forgiven of all the wrongdoing that he had against his father. God forgives all of our sin when we come to him in Christ. Because of what Jesus, who Jesus is and what he's done. Watch this. You ready? Oh, this is going to be good. This is going to be good. You ready? The daddy puts his own robe over him. Remember, if you don't know, hear it now. When you come to, to, to God through Jesus Christ in simple faith, when you come to him for the first time to enter into a relationship with him, and if you're in one, you need to remember this daily, right? That coat represents righteousness because I'm so unrighteous. I got the tractor stuck of my life big time, a bunch deep down in there to the other world. But I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? Me? Because that's the gift from God. It's Jesus' righteousness given to you as he takes your sin and my sin on himself. Not just that. Did you see that ring that he put on the finger? You can go back and read it later, maybe in your small group or personally. He puts a ring on his finger. Watch this. Woohoo! It's so good. Watch this. This is so huge for me and for maybe for all of us here. He puts a ring on his finger. You ready? Identity restored. His whole identity was wrapped up in his choices and his lifestyle and his sin. His whole choice was wrapped up in that far country and the things that he had done wrong. But here, right here, it's restored. Now he is a, he still was, he is a son of his father. Completely restored. And check this out. Whew. He gets shoes on his feet. You know what that means? <laughs> you know what that means? It's what we're all searching for. He gets purpose and placement. Shoes on his feet. There's a purpose restored to this boy. There's a purpose restored to this kid. The purpose restored to this guy. There's a placement in the family. There's some things that he gets to do with his father now. All that's restored. It was taken in the far country, but it's restored in his father's house. That's what God offers us in Christ Jesus. That restoration, that purpose, that placement. That's the good news. No wonder Paul prayed, oh, that we might know intimately, not just here, but here, this, the love of Christ and we'd be filled with all the fullness of God. No wonder, he said, this love is what compels me. It's why I don't live for myself, but I live for him who died and rose again. No wonder Paul said, that's the love that God wants to pour out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. It's a gift. We believe it and receive it. 
Now, here's another character. There's an older boy who, while the younger son was open rebellion against his father and against God, this one's rebellion looked a little different, but it was no less a rebellion. His rebellion was by the good, the things that he did with the wrong motive and attitude. This old boy that comes in out of the field, he's been working. He's been working. Working nine to five. Thank you, daughter. Here we go. So, oh, you know. Come on now. All right. So, he comes in out of the field, and he hears his music, and he goes up here in the service. Hey, what's going on out there? The servant says, well, your brother who was gone, like your father welcomed him home and told him the whole story. He's like, he killed the fatted calf. He's like, he killed the fatted calf. Are you kidding me? I, like, what are you talking about? Like, like the most special guest of all time. He said, he killed the fatted calf. Yeah, he killed the fatted calf. Also, they're having a celebration. He said, you tell my dad to come out to me. An equally offensive thing in Jewish culture. That boy should have been stoned on the spot too. He sees his daddy outside. His dad says, son, come on in. We're celebrating my love. And your, your, boy, your brother's home. Like he's recognized it. He's realized it. It's awesome. That brother goes, let me tell you something. I have worked my tail off for you. I have not disobeyed your commands. I've done everything that you've asked me to do. And you're telling me, you haven't even given me a young goat to celebrate with my friends. And you're telling me you're going to kill this fatted calf, this, this special thing for that boy, that kid who just ran your name through the dirt, who went with prostitutes and did all this kind of stuff with his body, all this stuff. You're going to do it for him? Now you might relate to this guy, maybe. So many of us in the room, myself included, have lived a life where we simply try to obey God and obey God and do whatever our denomination wants us to do, all good things, but simply to try to get right with God or so that God will do what we want him to do when we want him to do it for us. Pay attention what makes you angry with God. Been angry with God over the last couple of years? Things haven't gone your way? It's a famine in the land mentality, so to speak. Lots of things have been happening. Things haven't gone your way. Things don't look the way they should look. I've obeyed God. Why isn't God doing this for me now? Why is he letting this happen? And we get frustrated at circumstances and situations. We get mad at God. Why? Because we think obeying him means that he is in our debt. And a matter of fact, I am only in his this old boy is super judgmental. I don't know about you, but I've wrestled with this. The judgmental is that all he can do is point out the sins of his older brother. Anybody? You can only point out the sins of what somebody else is doing or they're so bad, and that's the comparison game. I'm not as bad as that person. While all, all in all, the inside of us, we ignore our own sin because we don't look outwardly like somebody else in their sin. But this old boy looked polished on the outside. The outside of the cup looked good, but inside is full of greed and lust and selfishness. It's like a tomb that looks really nice on the outside, but inside it's full of dead people's bones because he lives according to the law. I've got to do exactly right, and then maybe, maybe God will have to let me in, right? He'll have to forgive me. He'll have to do those things. But the letter, the, the law, the law, the letter kills, but it's only the gift of the Spirit that gives life. You see, here's what's crazy. This old boy grew up in his father's house, but he did not know his father. Is it possible that sometimes that we want the Father stuff, we want God, we want it, we do all these things because we want his stuff, but in actuality we do not want God. Is it possible we love God's stuff and his blessings and his benefits and they're all good, we want heaven and all these things, but deep down our heart is cold and we don't love God. Outwardly, it looks like you got some life, but inside, we don't love Christ. You see, one boy loved his sin, and his life got stuck. This old boy's tractor was stuck because he loved himself. I don't know, I wonder what the, what the street convo for this younger boy was down the road. And he met one of his friends that he used to know, and we knew where he was. And he goes, hey, man, how you doing? Uh, I've been in the far country. Oh, bro, you've been in the far country. I got you, baby. What's that you saying? No, 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 far country. I got you, brother. 
And the guy's like, well, I don't really know about that, but all I know is I, I humbled myself and I came. I was tired. I was low at this point. I knew it was my fault, but I came to my, my father and he surprised me. I mean, he pulled his pants up and he ran and he hugged me. He did all these things, like welcome me back in, put a robe and ring and shoes and spatted calf and celebration. And it was crazy. I've never experienced love like that. I, it surprised me. I didn't know what to do with it. It's I've never known God like that now. I've never, it's, I have a phenomenal relationship with my father now. The guy goes, man, I want a, I want a dad like that. He goes, well, he goes, there's a plenty of room in my father's house. If he wasn't so, I would have told you. He wants his house full. He opened the door for my brother, but boy, my brother didn't go in. <laughs> he, he was not happy. Do you know all the adventures that this son had with his father? And all the adventures that an older boy missed? Because he could not humble himself and recognize his need for forgiveness. Y'all remember my, my tractor story? <laughs> well, I'm sitting there. Sitting on the hill, tractor in front of me. I opened my, my dad's house over here. Well, I had to humble myself. So I got up and I turned and I went to my father in his house. He had just gotten home from work and he's sitting in his dress clothes. And I said, hey, dad, how you doing? He goes, good. He says, uh, well, you know your tractor and you know the things you told me not to do. Well, I did it. And your tractor is stuck. And by stuck, I mean stuck. <laughs> so he didn't say where he came out there. He looked at it. And by this time, you literally, true story, you literally cannot see the tractor because it's so sunk down deep, and it's like it's covered with stickers and briars. And what's interesting is that I don't know what I would have thought or why I would have thought it, but I, my dad didn't say a word. It was almost like he was, he was like going to the slaughter, didn't even open his mouth. But what he did is he got on the tractor that I got stuck. It's almost like he was taking on himself the wrong that I had done. He told me not to. I did it anyway. It was my fault. And he got on it. And, and here's the thing. I cannot tell you to this day. I asked my dad this the other day. He still doesn't know how he did it. I don't know to this day how in the world he did it. But he got my tra that tractor unstuck. Right? I have no idea. And I realize it's not my job to figure out how he did it. It is simply my job to receive and accept it as the gift it is and let it tra transform me. And my dad comes out. Now, he, he used to have this thick blood. Now he's got this thing where he's like on cumin and where his blood's really thin now. The sticker, the briars that were meant for me, the stickers didn't get me at all. But my dad comes out of there just completely cut, right? And his blood's just dripping <laughs> down his arms and stuff like that. And I looked at him and I saw him in that moment. And, y'all, I went up to my daddy and I gave him the biggest hug I think I've ever given him. And all my dirt and mud got on him. And all of his blood got on me. And I realized in that moment, maybe more than I ever have, that is the love that God has for me and for you, clearly displayed and poured out through Jesus Christ on the cross. Now, Jesus didn't technically get on a tractor. He got on a cross. And the thorns that were meant for me he wore on top of his head. And the dirt and the sin of my own choices, both outward and inward, he took willingly on himself so that all his blood, so to speak, could cover my life before God. And there's complete forgiveness. There's complete righteousness. There's restoration. There's identity restored. And there's placement and purpose in the family of God. That's a southern hallelujah. So in the story, I got my tractor stuck, my dad got it unstuck. I went to him, he took care of it. In the story, both of these sons, so to speak, if the tractor's their life, if their tractor's their sin, it's representative, it's figurative of, of all of their lives against God. If, that's, if both of their tractors in different ways got stuck, but only one went to their father and got the tractor unstuck. And one stayed stuck for all we know, forever. So I got a question for us tonight. If the tractor just represents your life with God, if the tractor just represents your life and the sin that's so just kind of just is in our DNA and the things that we've done or having to, if the tractor represents that, our life, 
The question that I have for us is, is your tractor stuck? Because here's the great thing. On the cross, Jesus got our tractor, our life, unstuck from that, that rut and that, na- that nasty sludge of sin that we had done, that we have done. Jesus took care of it on the cross so that when we go to him, it's like that tractor's unstuck and that hug takes place and that relationship is restored and begins. So is your tractor stuck? So here's what I, wanna, I want you to think about right now. You and me, right here, us before God, in this moment, tonight. Where's your life with God? Does it feel stuck? Does it feel like the, the, you're realizing maybe for some of you for the first time that, man, my sin is against God. And I deserve to stay stuck. And no matter how much I try, whether that's looking polished and trying to do all the right things, or that's just really openly rebelling, and I know that I'm stuck and I've hit the bottom of my life. I've hit the bottom, I've hit the, the, the end point. And the humbling part is, go home to your father. Go home to God. Because if this daddy in the story forgave his son, if my dad did all of this, how much more is God compassionate, moved to action towards us in our sin tonight? Because that's who he is. So the question is, have you come home to God yet? He came to find you. He came to restore relationship with you. He came to forgive your sins. He came to make you righteous. He came to to restore an identity as his child. He came to give you purpose and placement. But if your tractor's stuck and your life is stuck, Jesus came to unstuck your life and bring you to God. How do I know? How do I go home? What's the way? Jesus says, I am the way. Home. Let's pray a little bit. The band comes up. Lord, I thank you that that you're so near and so present. We don't deserve a visit from you, that's for sure. But I'm asking that you do what only you can do. Because there's a lot of us here that feel stuck that we need to begin a relationship with you. There's a lot of us here, God, that, that, that do love you, that just feel stuck in this pattern of sin. Like we don't want to hurt you, but we do. We need you to do what only you can do. I'm going to, as we're praying right now, if I just keep, keep praying and talking to the Lord yourself, I'm going to ask a question as we're praying, as, as our heads are bowed. This is a moment that God's really given us. It's a gift. For all of us, not just you but and me, both of us. I'm going to ask you right where you are tonight. Maybe God is for the first time opening your eyes to see this. That's such a gift from him. I remember when he did it for me. I thought I was going, I thought I belonged to God. I tried to do all the right things. I, put, I did both of these things. I pushed both ways like we see in the story. It's like all of a sudden God opened up and go, I don't know you. I thought I did, but I don't. And I remember hitting my knees in my living room floor. And saying, Jesus, I'm sorry that you saved me. And that was over 21 years ago. And that relationship with God began. Tractor unstuck. There are so many of you here that are living before God like orphans. Who are living before God like you don't have a place. When there's plenty of room in his house and in his family. There are so many of us in this room right here that our lives feel stuck because of our sin. And if that's you, and you don't, you've never entered into a personal, real relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and you know for you, like going to God and, and getting the, the tractor of your life unstuck, you know for you personally, between you and God, you know personally that, that to get it unstuck means that you need to go to Jesus for the very first time tonight and ask him to save you. Forgive your sins and make you his child. Now how this boy got up and publicly went to his father in front of everybody. I'm just going to ask if that's you and you know that's you and God's tapping you and you feel that kind of thing in your stomach going, I think this, this is me. And you realize that you need your sins forgiven and your life transformed by the love of Christ. 
and you want that first hug, that welcoming hug home into the family of God for the very first time, and you're ready to, to receive Christ and surrender your life to Jesus for the very first time, the Bible calls that salvation. If that's you, I'm going to invite you to believe the good news about Jesus for yourself tonight. And I'm going to ask that you are ready to accept Christ and let Jesus unstuck your life and forgive your sin and welcome you home. If that's you tonight for the very first time and you'd like to come home to God through Jesus tonight and you'd like him to change your life and save you, if that's you, I'm going to ask, would you just stand to your feet and say, I'm ready to receive Christ. I need Jesus right now. I want to go home. If that's you, would you stand on the count of three? One, two, three. Would you stand and receive Christ? Good. Welcome home. Good. Stand all, all over the room. This might, this, I don't know, this might be the one time when we realize that this is where God's inviting us home. If that's you, just stand to your feet and say, I want to receive Christ. I want to respond to the good news of his love. I want to come home. We see people all over the room. Hey, right where you are, if that's you. Man, I know this is how I get my tractor unstuck. I know to begin this relationship. That's me. I want to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. Is that you? Would you stand? Thank you. Good. Would you stand? Come home. Believe. And right where you are, personally, just talk to Jesus right where you are. And something like this in your own words, would you just say, Jesus, I'm sorry about my sin. Would you please forgive me? Would you save me? I receive you. Jesus, I trust you. Thank you, Lord. And youth leaders and people that are sitting around, if you see who stood, I want you to take note and, and gather them let, them. let them talk to you. Pray with them. Listen to what's going on in their lives. And for those of you that are standing that might have, now it's not about a prayer. It's about an attitude of the heart and responding to what Jesus says. The tractor of your life is unstuck. You now are forgiven of your sins, clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. Your identity is a child of God, and you have a purpose and a place in the family of God and the purpose and the mission of God. Well, Paul, how do you know? Because God said so, and Jesus paid for it. And if you stood and prayed, I want you to make sure you talk to your youth leaders. Just let them know what's going on, because we want to get you more and more plugged into what God's doing so that you can keep growing. And if you're standing, I want you to know something here. We might be great sinners, but Christ is a great Savior, and He loves you deeply. And He's not like saving you and leaving you. He's coming to live with you and walk with you through this life together. And I want to say welcome home. And everybody else, at this time, I say we give a southern hallelujah to God and praise the Lord. Ready? One, two, three. Good, good, good. Good. You can be seated. Youth leaders, I hope you see that. Now, for the, for the rest of you in the room, some of you might relate to that younger son. Some of you might relate to the older son in the story. Some of you in here might be, you love God. You love him. And I don't know about you, but there's sometimes I dip back into like that older brother mentality or something else. And I'm just like, ah, like, Lord, I want to love you, but I feel like I'm just stuck in this, this pattern of like this sin over and over again. You know? And maybe the night right where you are, as they play, maybe you want to make your chair an altar, kind of like you did this morning, and just say, Jesus, getting unstuck for you might just be going to him again. And it might be the same sin, but to go, Jesus, I know that you forgive me. I want to give you every, give you everything. Not like a rededication, but just saying, Jesus, I need to be unstuck from this. I know you paid for that, but I don't want to keep living this. I don't want to keep hurting you that way. And if that's you, and there's that like nagging sin, you love God, but it's just like, ah, oh, and you need to go home to your father. If that, you need a, a fresh hug from God, a fresh kiss of his love, so to speak. 
Man, if that's you, not here to embarrass you, but here to, to encourage you, if you want to just kind of spend some time with God, just turn around in your seat right there and just talk to him about that thing that's going on in your life and let him unstuck you. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to be spending some time doing that too. There's things that keeps coming over and over again. I'm like, Jesus, I want to love you. Just And learn to live in his victory and his love. But let's celebrate the love of God for us in Christ. Lord, I thank you. I love you. I praise you. Thanks for visiting with us. Pour your love out in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, I believe that you're great. I crown you Lord and Savior.